be with you. Welcome back, brothers and sisters. Welcome to Jesus via Mary, the best, surest, and the quickest way to the Sacred Heart of Jesus is through His Mother, the Blessed Virgin, the Immaculate Conception. She's our Mother too. Mary our Mother. Let's begin with a prayer. Remember, O most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known that anyone who fled to your protection, implored your help, or sought your intercession was left unaided. Inspired with this confidence, we fly unto you, O Virgin of Virgins, our Mother. To you do we come, before you we stand, sinful and sorrowful. O Mother of the Word Incarnate, despise not my petitions, but in your mercy hear and answer them. Amen. My friends, we have consecrated our entire apostolate including our radio ministry, to the Blessed Virgin Mary. Totus tuus, we are all yours, and everything we have is yours, Immaculata. Lead us and guide us. Today's program is dedicated to St. John Paul II. Brothers and sisters, in discussing the new and divine holiness, we may sometimes refer to the will of the Father, and at other times we may say Jesus' will. I must point out, so that there will be no misunderstanding, that the Father, and Jesus, and the Holy Spirit have the same will. There is only one will in the Blessed Trinity, the Divine Will. Look at this logically. Supposing, only for sake of discussion, that each person of the Blessed Trinity had a separate will. In that case, there could possibly be room for disagreement. No way. Cannot happen. There is only one God. And since God is immutable, meaning unchanging, there is and must be only one divine will. Now let's talk for a moment about the exemplars. Who are they? And why not just talk about the new and divine holiness itself without inserting the experience of some of the saints of days gone by? The exemplars discussed in Mr. Owen's book include Blessed Dina Ballinger, Blessed Elizabeth of the Trinity, who was a cloistered Carmelite nun, Blessed Luis Maria Martinez, Bishop, Martha Robin, Servant of God, Mary, the Blessed Virgin Mary, Saint Faustina, through whom Jesus gave us the Divine Mercy Devotion, Saint Maximilian Kolbe, Saint Therese of Lisieux, and Concepcion Cabrera de Armada, known as Conchita, and others who are equally, if not more so, vital to our understanding of this divine holiness, which is new to us now, right here, in this fullness of time. As for why we talk about the spirituality of saints of yesteryear, let me try to explain by taking you back to when Jesus walked and taught on earth. Responding to a request from his disciples, Jesus gave them and us a prayer, one prayer, the Our Father. Contained in this prayer is the supplication, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. By saying this prayer, Christians have been petitioning God for 2,000 years for the new and divine holiness without realizing completely what we were asking for or how overwhelmingly awesome this gift is, that gift that God desires us to have, to practice, to live, 
to become. The only way to do God's will on earth as it is done in heaven is in the new and divine holiness. St. Paul writes, In the fullness of time God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law. The fullness of time for the incarnation of Christ was be determined by God. The fullness of time for the new and divine holiness, right now, has also been determined by God. We were not ready for this gift earlier. Although revelation ended with Christ's death, further understanding of it, through gradual explanation over the centuries, the millennia, in part through the spirituality of the exemplars and others, the devotions given to them and practiced by the church, all of this took time. As with babes, mankind needed to be spoon-fed until God determined that we were ready for whole food. However, the new and divine holiness of the third millennium is not a mere devotion. It is a state of being, a way of life, an intimate participation in the interior life of Jesus Christ, which in turn is a loving awareness of the Father's will as the source of all that is in time and in eternity. We receive this gift which God desires to give us through the action of the Holy Spirit and Our Lady, the Blessed Virgin Mary. Now we mentioned that Mary is one of the exemplars, yet Mary is the saint personified, the Queen of Saints. Consider this. In the writings of Blessed Dina, Venerable Conchita, and the Servant of God, Archbishop Martinez, among others, Jesus invites us to participate with him in all of the activity of the Holy Trinity. But he also points to one who lived this identification with his interior life to the fullest extent possible to a human being, the Blessed Virgin Mary, our Mother. During the past century, the Holy Spirit has shed much new light on the interior life of Our Lady through the writings of the exemplars, especially St. Maximilian Kolbe. According to St. Kolbe, Our Lady abandoned herself to the will of the Father through the Holy Spirit so perfectly that from the first moment of her existence she shared one life with him. He explained, Among creatures made in God's image, the union brought about by married love is the most intimate of all. In a much more precise, more interior manner, the Holy Spirit lives in the soul of the Immaculata, in the depths of her very being. He makes her fruitful from the very first instant of her existence all during her life and for all eternity. This eternal Immaculate Conception, which is the Holy Spirit, produces in an Immaculate manner divine life itself in the womb or depths of Mary's soul, making her the Immaculate Conception, the human Immaculate Conception. The virginal womb of Mary's body is kept sacred for him. There he conceives in time, because everything that is a material happens in time. He conceives in time the human life of the man-god. Reflecting on St. Maximilian's insights into the reign of the Holy Spirit in Mary, Dominican theologian Father Manto Bonamy writes, the Holy Spirit is her spirit. Far from being alienated in her personality because of the dominance of the Holy Spirit, 
She is, on the contrary, more than any other creature, in full possession of herself. It is characteristic of God that he acts in us in such a manner that our actions are truly ours. Of herself, Mary the Immaculate is not God. Unlike Christ, who is God himself, the Son of the Father. But she lives only in a state of divine synergy with the Holy Spirit, the Lord and Giver of life. In her state of divine synergy with the Holy Spirit, Our Lady participates, with Jesus of course, in all of the Spirit's work of sanctification, just as she wills what God wills in all of creation and redemption. In this way she is able to place her seal of love, so to speak, on all the works of God. Father Bonamy further writes, If Mary, as a humble daughter of Adam, came into existence only after innumerable generations of human beings, she was already present in God's own mind, outside of time, in the Holy Spirit himself. In God's eternal now, where she exists forever, she lives and reigns as the Sovereign Mother above all other creatures, cooperating in God's divine task of governing the world, embracing the entire scope of creation before her and after her. That is why Father Colby does not hesitate to identify Mary with wisdom, the artificer of all. According to Blessed Dina Ballinger, by offering the good works of Jesus together with him in behalf of all souls past, present, and future, Our Lady participated fully in Jesus' redemptive work. Blessed Dina wrote, I was not to worry about anything but to let my Blessed Mother have her way. She undertook to make reparation and bring to perfection the past, the present, and the future, making everything ready through the merits of our Lord and her own. That is why I am certain to glorify God in heaven to the extent he desires of me. By letting the Blessed Mother have her way in her thoughts, words, and actions, Blessed Dina gave God the glory that he ought to have received from all creatures. Thus she participated with Our Lady in bringing to perfection the entire mystical body of Christ past, present, and future. I know this is uh, pretty intense, brothers and sisters, so let's take a one-minute break. I just want to remind you that two days from now, on the 31st of May, we celebrate the visitation of the Blessed Virgin Mary to her cousin Elizabeth. Mary took Jesus to the baby, unborn baby, who would become St. John the Baptist, just as she always brings Jesus to each one of us. When she took Jesus to visit her cousin Elizabeth, as soon as Mary greeted her, Elizabeth felt the baby jump in her womb. He was sanctified. Therefore, he was born without original sin, but not conceived without it. That's a privilege that only the Blessed Virgin Mary has. So two days from now on uh, On Saturday, the 31st of May, is the Feast of the Visitation. Now let's see what John Paul II says about a new Pentecost and fullness of time. That term keeps coming up. In the light of several statements of Pope John Paul II, this new outpouring of the Holy Spirit seems to be nearing fulfillment in our time, in our time. In his encyclical, Dominum et Vivificantem, in 1986, John Paul wrote, In the time leading up to the third millennium after Christ, while the Spirit and the Bride say to the Lord Jesus, Come, in other words, Maranatha, Come Lord Jesus, 
This prayer of theirs is filled, as always, with eschatological significance, which is also destined to give fullness of meaning to the celebration of the great jubilee. It is a prayer concerned with the salvific destinies towards which the Holy Spirit, by his action, opens hearts throughout the history of men on earth. But at the same time, this prayer is directed toward a precise moment of history, which highlights the fullness of time, marked by the year 2000. The Church wishes to prepare for this jubilee in the Holy Spirit. In light of the significance that sacred scripture attaches to the phrase fullness of time, for instance, in Ephesians 1.10, the Pope's remarks seem to express some new hope of a new divine initiative in our day. In his recent book, Gift and Mystery, Pope John Paul described the decisive influence upon him of the true devotion to Mary written by St. Louis de Montfort. From St. Louis the Pope drew the inspiration for his priestly ministry, his motto, Totus Tuus, and his spirituality of total consecration to Jesus through Mary. In his introduction to the true devotion, St. Louis had predicted a future period in which new prodigies of holiness would take place through the action of Our Lady and the Holy Spirit. St. Maximilian Kolbe described a spirituality of total renunciation of the human will in favor of the divine will reigning in Mary. The new and divine holiness is a new and deeper participation in the interior life of Jesus Christ through the action of the Holy Spirit and Our Lady. Therefore, to understand what makes up the new and divine holiness, we must first reflect upon the interior life of Jesus as it appears in sacred scripture and tradition. Then we will see how the exemplars illuminate the deposit of faith and invite us to a greater intimacy with Jesus. Humanly speaking, the interior life of Jesus begins in eternity, where he is eternally aware of his generation from the Father. From eternity, Jesus recognizes his origin in the all-loving will of his Father. He is, in the words of the Nicene Creed, the only begotten Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God. In the writings of the Exemplars, Jesus has spoken of this mystery many times, notably in the writings of Venerable Conchita, to whom our Lord confided. I owed my Father divine life, since he engendered me eternally, and human life by the Holy Spirit, who is his Spirit. For this reason I did not forget him for an instant on earth. In St. John's Gospel, Jesus testified to the reign of the Father's will in his created humanity, saying, Amen, amen, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever he does, that the Son does likewise. I can do nothing on my own authority. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This loving awareness of the will of his Father remained at the center of the consciousness of Jesus from the moment of his incarnation. Jesus told Conchita, 
I had no other food from the first moment of my incarnation than His divine will. It is through it I came into this world. Through it I was raised above the earth to consummate my life in the cruelest of martyrdoms. The redemption was naught but the faithful accomplishment of this divine will. Its echo sounds constantly in the depths of my most loving heart, causing it to throb for the salvation of souls and the glorification of my Father. This then forms the first step to an intimate participation in the interior life of Jesus, a loving awareness of the Father's will as the source of all that is in time and in eternity. Jesus told Conchita, This was my life on earth. This has been and is my life in heaven. To love, to venerate, and to gratify the wishes of my Father, and to have one soul will with his. And this is the perfection of love of man, the supreme end of transformation into me. It was this loving awareness of the Father's will inspired in her heart by the Holy Spirit which enabled Blessed Dean and Ballinger to say, Each event, whatever it may be, seems like a warm ray of sunlight issuing from the very center of the infinite Son, capital S-U-N, that is the heart of the Trinity. It was this same loving awareness that inspired St. Faustina to write, I nourish myself on the will of God. It is my food. There is one word I need and continually ponder. It is everything to me. I live by it and die by it. And it is the holy will of God. It is my daily food. My whole soul listens intently to God's wishes. I do always what God asks of me, although my nature often quakes, and I feel that the magnitude of these things is beyond my strength. I know well what I am of myself, but I also know what the grace of God is which supports me. Because Jesus abandoned himself to the will of the Father through the action of the Holy Spirit, Sacred Scripture often expresses the relationship between Jesus and the Divine Will in terms of the anointing of the Holy Spirit. For example, in Mark 1, Jesus is baptized by John the Baptist. The Father confirms his Divine Sonship, and the Holy Spirit rests upon him with power. Immediately, according to Mark, the Spirit drove him into the wilderness. In Luke's Gospel, Jesus begins his public ministry by announcing his fulfillment of Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news. Again, in the infancy narratives in Luke's Gospel, the will of the Father made known through the Son is carried out by the power of the Holy Spirit. Even in his glorified humanity, Jesus acts solely in and by the power of the Holy Spirit. According to the book of Acts, the risen Jesus instructed the apostles through the Holy Spirit. Acts 1-2 Pope John Paul II has observed that the reign of the Father's will in Jesus through the Holy Spirit reached its fullest expression in the sacrifice of the cross. In the sacrifice of the Son of Man, the Holy Spirit is present and active, just as he acted in Jesus' conception, in his coming into the world, in his hidden life, and in his public ministry. According to the letter to the Hebrews, on the way to his departure through Gethsemane and Golgotha, the same Jesus Christ, in his own humanity, opened himself totally to the action of the spirit, Paraclete, who from suffering 
enables eternal salvific love to spring forth. To the exemplars, Jesus underscored the role of the Holy Spirit in imposing the sweet reign of his Father's will. He told Conchita, Every movement of my soul has been inspired and carried out under the movement of the Holy Spirit. He it is who animates my faculties, my senses, my will, holding them in his possession for the glory of the Father, to whom I return everything. The second step, then, to an intimate participation in the interior life of Jesus is the total abandonment of our human will to the will of the Father through the reign of the Holy Spirit. Brothers and sisters, I want to share with you an insight from St. John Eudes, E-U-D-E-S. He lived in the early 1600s. I ask you to consider that our Lord Jesus Christ is your true head, and that you are one of his members. He belongs to you as the head belongs to its members. All that is his is yours, his spirit, his heart, his body and soul, and all his faculties. You must make use of all these as your own, to serve, praise, love, and glorify God. You belong to him as members belong to their head. And so he longs for you to use all that is in you, as if it were his own, for the service and glory of the Father. With these insights, St. John Eudes opened the way to a popular understanding of the spirituality of the exchange of wills, or exchange of hearts, which lies at the core of the new and divine holiness in our time. But he also reawakened in the church the memory of another truth, the necessity of a growth in holiness in the mystical body of Christ. According to Eudes, the mysteries of Jesus must be perfected not only in us individually, but in the whole church. In keeping with this principle, just as the sufferance, sufferings, apparent defeat, and death of Jesus preceded the triumph of his resurrection, so the sufferings, apparent defeat, and death of the church must precede her triumph, which Our Lady of Fatima later referred to as the triumph of of my Immaculate Heart, and an era of peace. Moreover, just as Jesus performed the greatest miracles of his public ministry, the raising of Lazarus, for example, and the institution of the Holy Eucharist, immediately prior to his Passion, so we can expect that he will pour out tremendous graces upon the Church immediately prior to her Passion and apparent defeat. Finally, just as Jesus returned to earth in his resurrected body after his sufferings and death, so his mystical body, the church, will be resurrected after her apparent defeat to establish the public, earthly, and universal reign of the Eucharistic and Sacred Heart of Jesus. Brothers and sisters, I know this is very profound, so if you'd like to get a link where you can listen to our programs a second or third time over the Internet, send us an email. Our address is Mary at aol.com. Mary at aol.com. Put the word link on the subject line, and we'll get it right back to you. Let's say a prayer to our Father. O oh, Father, may your will made known in Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit, reign in us through Mary. Holy Spirit, Mary, Mother, unite us to Jesus that together we may live in the bosom of the Father, in the heart of the Trinity. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. See you next time. God bless.